Thank you. Uh, and most of all, thank you for inviting me from the outside in, as it were, because I'm not a landscape architect. I'm an ecologist first, but I'm not an apologist for nature or for cities. And in fact, I think it's helpful today to hear the counterpoint. And I'm going to speak in addition to the city. So listen carefully. Do you recognize this voice? I bet most of you don't. Does it give you pause? She's angry, this one. The Wolverine F-11 has been trapped. She's pacing, waiting to be radio collared. She will eat through the wire that contains her within a matter of hours, and she waits for no one. What about this call? Does this chorus resonate for you, deep in your viscera? It should. It should remind you of the time when you are prey. Only when you are prey and when you know it are you really alive. <laughs> but most of us have forgotten because, of course, humans are now an urban species. For the first time in our history, more than half the world's 7.4 billion humans live in urban settlements. We have become the single dominant species shaping the planet from its surface lands and waters to its climate, and by extension, to the future of all other species on Earth. The Anthropocene age is, of course, upon us, and we, humans, are its defining species. But what of the others? And by the most conservative estimate, of course, the other two and a half million so far known species on Earth. Who in the Anthropocene will speak for them, for these creatures, and for their wild places? Where will be the wild things? And through their fading reflection, what will become of the wild within the human? In the last 40 years, landscape architecture has risen to prominence, and in some cases even to dominance, I'd argue. Within the applied professions of city building and urban placemaking, in North America, the most urgent challenges posed by the environmental crises of the mid-20th century, some of which are referred to, of course, in the 1966 Declaration, these have been to a large extent recognized, managed, remediated, and in a few rare cases, even solved. Indeed, the rise of the 1970s and 80s third wave environmentalism was activated in large part through landscape architecture and supported by the allied disciplines of ecology, environmental planning, environmental studies, and associated sciences. Together with landscape architects, these allies advocated, planned, and designed for environmentally responsible solutions, reducing and cleaning, top, cleaning up toxic waste, controlling pollution to some extent, improving waste management, and initiating the environmental conservation movement. These and other strategies were effective reactions as crisis management, and they've now given way to more proactive strategies for longer term, larger scale, more complex challenges related to climate change and sustainability, for example. I'd argue landscape architecture has been at the center of this shift, from new urbanism to landscape urbanism to the green infrastructure we've heard about so much this morning. Some might conclude that the landscape architect has arrived center stage as the Anthropocene urban savior. But on this urbanizing planet, what remains of the wild? More urgently, what will become of the wild things and their places and of the quality of being that defines not only them, but by extension, us? On the relentless trajectory of global urbanization, we continue to lose millions of acres each year of the Earth's natural and agricultural cover uh, through land conversion, the loss of natural habitats, whether it's by swift condemnation and conversion or by the cumulative paper cuts of habitat fragmentation and degradation, ultimately leads, ultimately leads to the irretrievable loss of biodiversity. The Anthropocene is the planet's sixth great extinction epoch, from almost daily extirpation to mass extinction. The wealth of the world's biodiversity is bleeding away. While we may lament the loss of the wild, we also exacerbate it by failing to validate and value what it is to be wild. Honoring the condition of wildness is fundamental to valuing the wild things and caring for their places, central tenets in achieving and activating their protection through design. The wild and its essence will not persist if we retreat passively. 
We cannot simply do nothing, for I assure you, neglect is not benign. A different wild will inevitably emerge from the void left behind, from invasive species to barren fields and environments hostile to humans. An evolving new nature, an unintended consequence of our own design, will simply select humans out, replacing us with plague and pest alike. Our role, instead, must then be as active agents in reaffirming, reestablishing, and revaluing the place and the role of the wild. Policies and targets for wilderness protection vary widely, from the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity's goal of 17% by 2020, to famed ecologist E.O. Wilson's ambitious half-Earth movement to protect from development 50% of the world's natural landscapes. In the abstract, these targets are blunt instruments. They need design and design intervention to engage in the imagination and to empower action. From restoration sites to rewilding initiatives, from greenways to green infrastructure, we must engage in nothing less than a planetary strategy of landscape connectivity. Large wilderness is now rare, but its interstitial spaces will be the practice of the everyday. Designing and remaking connections between the remnant wild fragments will be paramount. From Richard Weller's mongrel places of the in-between to novel and hybrid ecosystems to agricultural working lands to reserves for hunting and harvesting and even the derelict places of urban decay. Taken together, cumulatively, from inside the city and out, these landscapes will form a wild mosaic for the next wave of conservation. In the Anthropocene, there is no away to which we retreat. There is no pristine place unaffected by human hands. Rather, we need design tactics for the sp full spectrum of landscapes from urban to suburban to peri-urban to rural to wilderness. The old wilderness is now but fragments. And the wild and its qualities will be found in the refuges and the connective tissue in between. The local work of the landscape architect will be humble to stitch together these fragments, but the cumulative design is nothing short of planetary. We must reweave the tapestry of the wild back into the landscapes of the future. To lose the wild is to lose that thing, that quality which makes us most human. The saddest irony is that in wasting the wild, we lose a vital, visceral, and a primal part of ourselves. Yet landscape architecture has the tools to integrate these stories and to do this through the medium of design, reflecting the relationship between wild places and the emotional responses they provoke and the very human qualities they evoke. Reflected in art, anchored in master plans and policies, implemented in design, landscape architecture has the power and the authority to make legible the story of the wild and to recenter its place within the landscapes you make. And by extension, this means to wake the wild within the human. So now I urge us all today, as landscape architects and allies, reaffirm the primordial place of the wild, reactivate the wild, the, ro the vital role of the wild things, and reconnect the landscapes that sustain us all. In so doing, I ask you, I urge you, design with awareness, humility, intention, direction, and conviction. To honor the voice of the wild, we must listen for it. And to reveal the sublime of wild places, we must actually see them. And to reassert the wildness that makes us human, we must ultimately value it. For without the wild, I'm afraid we are condemned to the endless monochrome, lost to a monoculture of our own making. Thanks.